Hello, Endeavor here. In light of the recent purges of prominent right-wing YouTube channels and the continued crackdown on free speech across social media platforms, I think it's only fitting that the next video in my series, Lies of the Enlightenment, will focus on the lie that is the marketplace of ideas. It's a term that has been kicked around a lot in recent years, most notably by Enlightenment liberal types. The term was used quite often back around 2016 by what was called the skeptic community in those days in response to calls for censorship by progressive activists. And it's used quite often today by figures of the so-called intellectual dark web. However, the concept of the marketplace of ideas dates all the way back to the Enlightenment era. It has been a theory used to describe how discourse within a liberal democracy affects policy decisions, and has been used as a justification for free speech absolutism. The argument goes that free and open discourse creates a marketplace of ideas similar to a market economy for goods. This will allow all ideas to be discussed and considered by the public. With maximum access to information, the public will be able to weigh different arguments and make a reasoned decision upon what's the best idea to implement through a democracy. The justification for absolute freedom of speech is that bad ideas will not be implemented because they'll be debunked by facts, reason, logic, and evidence, and no one will want to vote for them. By allowing all ideas to be discussed, the best ideas will rise to the top since they're backed up by the evidence and will win out in the marketplace of ideas. And that is supposedly what people will vote for. The marketplace of ideas was first proposed by 17th century English philosopher John Milton. But probably the most noteworthy proponent of this concept was John Stuart Mill in the 19th century. Mill argued that all ideas, no matter how unpopular, must be permitted to be expressed because then it could be discussed, considered, and either accepted or rejected by the public. He argued this would yield the best course of action for society possible because the best ideas would win out in the marketplace. Mill believed that humans are fundamentally rational creatures that have the capacity to weigh the evidence that they're presented with and come to a conclusion based on it. That they form their beliefs through empirical verification and that free discourse gives people the greatest accessibility to this. Voltaire had a somewhat similar argument for free speech in the 18th century. Though Voltaire never actually said, I disprove of what you say but I will defend to the death your right to say it, his views on the issue have been summarized as such. He saw free speech as a weapon to uproot the perceived authoritarian practices of monarchs or the church of his day, and that this would result in liberalization. Now, I need to make this clear from the get-go or else people will misunderstand me. I support free speech. Hell, I wouldn't be running this channel otherwise. I believe the ability to criticize authority is both positive and necessary. I believe that free expression of ideas is being greatly suppressed both by Western governments and large tech companies. I support an internet bill of rights that would guarantee free speech on social media platforms which hold a monopoly on their respective means of communication. But that's not the point of this video. The point is that the concept of the marketplace of ideas as described by John Stuart Mill fails to understand how discourse actually takes place in society, or how consensuses are formed. While many will agree that in this age of censorship, the free market of ideas doesn't exist today. I would argue that it never has existed, and that it never can. And if it could exist, would it even be desirable? First of all, we'll look at this concept in the abstract. Why is it so flawed? Firstly, Mill believes that people are these rational beings who will carefully consider the empirical evidence they are presented with, and come to a well-reasoned, objective conclusion. This is a ridiculous proposition to make because it assumes that people are not predisposed to bias. If you have ever been in an argument of any kind, you'll know that this is obviously not true. People don't just change their opinions when empirical evidence is presented to them. This is because people are more predisposed to think religiously than they are to think purely rationally as Mill assumes. And this goes for people who aren't even religious. People base their understanding of the world on first principles which will determine how they interpret the empirical knowledge they receive. Ben Shapiro is famous for the phrase, facts don't care about your feelings, but Richard Spencer responded that feelings don't care about your facts, and this is true. People are more influenced by symbols, narratives, and values than they are by graphs and numbers. They trust first principles much more, and this is true for people on all sides, including myself. For example, a right-wing nationalist is likely to reject almost all arguments for large numbers of immigration. 
even if a good argument is presented to them. Because while I'm obviously a huge critic of it, there do exist some good arguments in favor of the current immigration system. But a nationalist is going to reject them, not based on empirical evidence, but due to their first principles, which include things like self-determination, the nation-state, and cultural cohesion. Likewise, a progressive is almost certain to reject any calls to restrict immigration from a particular part of the world. Again, even if an argument based on facts and statistics was presented, they hold equality as one of their first principles. So even if there is very little benefit to allowing immigration from the third world, a progressive is likely to oppose any ban on it due to their belief in equality. This is why debates between the left and the right rarely end in a consensus being reached. Because rather than the ideas competing against each other in a marketplace to find an objective solution, two religions with vastly different first principles are actually clashing with each other. And when I say people tend to think more religiously than rationally and base their beliefs on first principles, I don't think this is a bad thing. I also extend this to non-religious people too. I'd go so far to say that the classic liberals who propose the marketplace of idea function on first principles far more than they do empirical evidence like they claim. Because there is one thing that I can't stand about John Stuart Mill, Voltaire, or any intellectual dark web figure of the present day. It's that they assume the marketplace of ideas will prove their ideas correct. Because they hold things like democracy, secularism, egalitarianism, and anti-authoritarianism as first principles. They present illiberal ideologies as fundamentally irrational and incapable of surviving in the marketplace of ideas. But I haven't found this to be the case. In fact, if there's anything that free discourse has convinced me of, it's that liberalism creates a dysfunctional society. But would me presenting my illiberal arguments convince one of them to abandon liberalism if I present the best case? No, obviously not. In fact, most of these Enlightenment liberals refuse to debate anyone in the dissident right. I'm sorry to dig up this old turd, but a great example of this is none other than the laughing stock that is Kraut and Tea. This Enlightenment liberal intellectual who proclaimed the brilliance of the marketplace of ideas took a step into the marketplace to take on race realism and lost. Was his response to look at the evidence and change his views accordingly? No, it was to go on a two year long emotional outburst. Because Kraut T is fundamentally an egalitarian, and when presented with evidence that went against egalitarianism, he couldn't accept something that went against his first principles. So I'd argue the free market of ideas doesn't exist on a micro level due to people's predisposition to bias rather than pure rationality. But it also doesn't exist on the macro level either, because just as individuals hold first principles, so do societies. The foundations of a civilization justify its existence and determine the direction that it goes in as a society. And if a civilization wishes to survive, its foundations must be upheld. For example, from the late Roman Empire until the early 20th century, the foundation of Western civilization was Christianity. It gave the West the justification for its existence, formed its civilizational narrative, and determined its direction. And that's why it was something that needed to be defended. They couldn't simply allow their societal foundations to be subverted. So there were certain ideas that were simply off the table. Christianity was backed up by force. And as someone who believes that Christian European civilization was a fundamentally good thing, I believe that enforcing it was justified. And just so I don't get some idiot fedora commenting on this video, no, I don't support burning people at the stake. However, I acknowledge that if an order wishes to uphold itself and survive, it can't simply allow for its own subversion. This is why Islam is enforced today in the Middle East. Because that is their civilizational foundation and they know that they must defend it if they wish their civilization to continue. Now, according to Enlightenment thinkers like Mill and Voltaire, this is just authoritarianism which limits people's freedom and prevents progress. They believe that no values should be enforced at all that a free society should allow all beliefs to coexist in their marketplace of ideas. Well, what actually happened when the West stopped enforcing its own foundations? Do we now live in a truly classical liberal society? No, we're under a new paradigm, globalism. In my previous video, I explained how progressive institutions exert their power over the West. But it's easy to forget that post-World War II, the left were the ones who championed free speech. 
They painted Joseph McCarthy, who did nothing wrong, by the way, as an authoritarian and anti-freedom tyrant for his suppression of communist and socialist ideas. I tend to believe that the reason McCarthyism failed was not because of how authoritarian he was, but rather that the ideas that he was fighting actually had a lot more money and power behind them than people realized at the time. They were up in arms at the church's effort to censor porn and other sexually explicit materials. But they never really did believe in free speech. They just used it as a tool to undermine the Christian European values of the West and replace them with progressive globalism. But now that they're the ones in control, they'll do whatever they can to deny a platform to any right-wing opposition. The new left ideas that made their way into the dialogue through the doorway of free speech in the 1960s now form the morality of the globalist West of the present day. And just like the Christian church of old, the establishment today know that they cannot allow that morality to be subverted, else the entire project would fall apart. They've built an entire egalitarian morality backed up by the narrative that progressivism has liberated the West from its racist, sexist, and homophobic past. And they know that they can never allow ideas like race realism, European ethnic interests, traditionalism, or anti-democratic thought to ever enter the discourse. Or to have people question who is pushing these new left ideas and why. Because even if these ideas are backed up by empirical evidence, they would undermine the entire globalist project. So the powers today know that they must snuff them out before they gain any traction. This is the entire purpose of organizations like the ADL, the SPLC, Hope Not Hate, or the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. It's to crush certain ideas by any means necessary before they ever enter public discourse. There's an absolute garbage argument pushed by the self-proclaimed free speech activists like Dave Rubin and Milo Yiannopoulos that censoring an idea makes it more powerful. That censorship pushes an idea underground where it can't be debunked by the superior facts, logic, and evidence of the marketplace. This is utter nonsense. If you want to destroy an idea, you crush it before it ever gets a chance. Some liberal thinkers like Karl Popper actually admit to this. He was an advocate for a liberal democracy, or what he referred to as an open society, but he identified fascism and communism as the enemies of his so-called open society, and advocated for them to be removed from the discourse. He claimed that in order to uphold tolerance, you have to be intolerant of intolerance, and by intolerance he means anything critical of liberal democracy. The leftist channel Three Arrows actually made a video on the marketplace of ideas as well, in which he calls for anti-democratic thought to either be censored or outright criminalized. Now, while I certainly don't want the same thing for the world that he does, I fully understand why he holds this position. If you were in full control, why would you even give your opponents an inch? And he'll claim that it's because democracy is an infallible good, but in reality, it's actually about power. That is why we are seeing so much censorship today. It's also why we need to get these ideas out. This is why the marketplace of ideas doesn't exist in any real sense, because we don't have ideas competing against each other on the basis of their merit, but rather of the amount of institutional strength that they have behind them. Because regardless of public opinion, the ability of powerful institutions to manufacture the change they want is infinitely more powerful than argumentation. And they've intentionally set up the Overton window to keep certain ideas out. We can actually observe this taking place if we look at several major issues of the past few decades, and how public opinion often ran counter to the narratives pushed by powerful institutions and what was eventually implemented. I'll link below a fascinating video by Academic Agent on how homosexuality was normalized in the UK. He points out that during the 1980s, as it was being heavily promoted by the media, it was strongly opposed by the general public. In the video, Academic Agent shows how only once the public had been subjected to decades of propaganda did it become normalized, and once it was, it became essentially illegal to criticize. And today, it was actually recently reported that support for the LGBT movement reached a high in around 2017 and has declined since then. So is it possible that we'll have another debate in the future? No, because there was never a debate to begin with. It was simply imposed by powerful institutions. Another major issue in which there never really was any debate was with immigration. A recent example from Canada of this was that there was billboards placed up across the country by an unaffiliated supporter of Maxine Bernier and the People's Party of Canada. The billboards read, Say No to Mass Immigration. After outcry from the mainstream media and left-wing activists, the company that hosted the billboards called Patterson Outdoor Advertising removed the billboards. So the message was just shut down, but is say no to mass immigration an unpopular opinion in Canada? 
No, Global News recently reported that 63% of Canadians supported a reduction in immigration. We often think of Canada as this liberal country, but actually mass immigration is extremely unpopular. So even though Bernier's policies of reducing immigration is popular, it's being pushed out of the discourse by the powers that be, because they know that they can never allow this idea to gain any traction. And again, this is nothing new. This was the case in 1968 when Enoch Powell gave his famous Rivers of Blood speech about immigration to the United Kingdom. At the time, he was destroyed by the media and the political establishment in the UK, yet Gallup actually reported that 74% of the British public agreed with his speech. Yet the idea was just completely shut down and immigration numbers only increased in the following decades. In reality, there's been very little debate over the direction that Western countries have been taken in for the last 70 years. So believing that there exists a marketplace of ideas is foolish. Because it gives progressives the ability to rewrite history and say, we had a debate and we won. But it's been decided, so we don't need any more debate. Now, the marketplace of ideas might not exist today, but should it? If right-wingers were in a theoretical situation where we were the ones in control, should we allow left-wing ideas into the discourse so that we can debunk them? No, it's a game of power and to allow yourself to be subverted is foolish. And would I defend to the death a migrant's right to lecture me about white privilege or colonialism or the patriarchy in my own country? Hell no. And I know that that's difficult to say since right now we're fighting for our free speech and that you're just kind of giving the left the justification to shut you down. But I think this is just the reality of how power works and it'll happen regardless. I'll play a clip from a live stream I had with Morgoth where we discussed the issue of speech and power because he says it better than I could. I mean, I remember the, when, the after we had the BNP surge, which was a genuine nationalist party, um, about 10 years ago and throughout the early 2000s. And, yeah, they, they, were, they were pretty hardcore by today's standards. But then the, the, like the, the state infiltrated the party, the party was bankrupted, the party was taken to court, new laws were passed so that their policies were, were illegal. Uh, and eventually the, the party was just destroyed, really. But then after it happened, you had the, the left, the sort of liberal intelligentsia, the lefty intelligentsia, saying that we, we had the debate and the public had decided that the BNP wasn't for them. But in, in actual fact, that when you removed the name, when you just listed out their policies and you removed the name of the BNP, they were like, easily the most popular um, positions to hold, policies to have in the country. It was just that they were, first of all, they were toxified, uh, they slurred, slandered and smeared just relentlessly, I mean, worse than Trump got. But then on top of that, they were infiltrated and destroyed. And then after the, you know, after the, it all crashed and burned, it was passed off as if, well, we've had the, we've had that public debate over uh, these these ideas, and the public decided that they didn't want them. And I thought, no, that wasn't what happened at all. What happened was that the elite destroyed the party and brainwashed the public. One of the things that interests me that the liberals on YouTube really seem to love people like uh, Victor Orban. Uh, but Victor Orban isn't isn't a liberal. He's not their guy. He he. He, lock, he throws people out. He bans people from the country. He shuts down left-wing media organizations and all that kind of thing. He specifically said that he wasn't going to have a uh, liberal democracy. He was going to have Christian democracy. But you see, in the, then they, they, they want to be edgelords and they want they want to sort of own that, um, the, the sort of YouTube liberals. But the, it's not actually the case. He's, he's actually of the right. Um, and he is using authoritarianism to protect the Hungarian people. Because what you could do, let's just say, um, he could allow the marketplace of ideas to happen, and then Hungary could be infiltrated with uh, social justice warriors, George Soros, money would start funding little organizations, maybe some websites which were promoted and maybe a university course here or there. And what you'd find is that concepts such as white privilege um, would start slipping into the Hungarian lexicon or the idea that there was something dark and guilty about Hungary's past. And God knows in Eastern Europe, they've got enough to dig up. But um, 
And the question is whether or not you would allow that to grow legs and run amok in the society, or if you would just snuff it out from the inception. And I think for the general good, you'd have to say, well, let's just snuff it out for, at the beginning. And it, I mean, that can actually be done in Eastern Europe, but we're way past that point in the West now. It's, it's sort of trench warfare. Lastly, the final flaw with Mill's marketplace of ideas is the assumption of universality. That through discourse and debate, the best possible course of action can be reached. In a unified and cohesive society, maybe this would be possible. But in the modern, globalized, and multicultural West, this is a pipe dream. There is no course of action that can be taken today that will satisfy everyone. Because what's good for one group could be awful for another group. Sometimes there is just no liberal solution, and no amount of debate can change that. That is the case today. Because there are people benefiting from globalism, there is a reason things like mass migration, the destruction of our culture, and social atomization are being pushed in the West. It benefits someone, maybe in some groups marketplace of ideas this all makes sense, but not the majority of people, and certainly not for people of European descent. But it's a game of power, and those in power cannot allow the groups that are being screwed to advocate for themselves. And I do have to be honest, a victory for the right wing would screw someone else. There are some people out there who no amount of argumentation will ever convince. Now, I think that the cause of the dissident right is just and fair for the greatest number of people, but I do have to acknowledge that there's people out there who what I'm advocating for simply is not in their best interests. Now, does that change my opinions? No, I'm not going to accept being the loser because it would be mean to do otherwise. And that is why there is no liberal solution to the problems in the West. So what lessons can we learn from this lie of the Enlightenment? First of all, you can't make the mistake of thinking that you just need to compile enough facts and statistics and once you present them, you'll win anyone over. Because people aren't these rational beings like Mill claims they are. They hold principles which often supersede empirical evidence. This is why culture, narratives, and imagery is often more effective at winning someone over than data. The word propaganda has negative connotations today, but it does work. The left knows this, just watch any of Blackpilled's videos. I still think that data matters and should be compiled, but don't shy away from propaganda. Because you need to change people's principles if you're going to change their outlook. If you can't do that, no amount of data is going to convince them. Secondly, if you're a right winger, you can't expect to be treated fairly. You will be censored. Now, I don't want this to be the case. I wish we were free to express our ideas, but the reality is that we will be shut down. And if the situation were reversed, would I give the left full access to a platform I controlled? No. They won't allow subversion and neither would I. That's the nature of power. There is not going to be an agreement reached with these tech giants or these universities where they allow us to speak freely. The powers that be know damn well that they can't allow dissident right-wing ideas to enter the discourse. They will try to strangle it in the crib, and that's why we need to get these ideas into the discourse. Because they're inherently subversive, we won't be given free speech, so we need to work for it. I would absolutely love there to be an internet bill of rights which would guarantee us a spot on these platforms, but the prospects of that coming about are uncertain at best. This is why alternative platforms are so important, and with the recent YouTube purge, they've become even more important. James Alsup and other content creators had their channels taken down. They've also deleted but then restored channels like Iconoclast or A Way of the World. But they have the power to purge all of right-wing YouTube overnight and there's not much we can do about that at this point. So we can't get into a false sense of security. I'm going to end this video with an important request. Please subscribe to my BitChute channel and to the channels of other content creators who have opened BitChute accounts. I'm going to run the YouTube wagon until the wheels fall off, but we have to be prepared for when that happens because I feel as though it's just a matter of time. My bit shoot is linked down below. I'll also link a list that Morgoth compiled of right-wingers who are now on BitChute. I'm considering future exclusive content on the platform, so make sure to follow me there, because the free market of ideas on YouTube has been cancelled. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and follow me on Twitter. If you'd like to join my new Discord community, or you'd like to support the channel, you can now do so. Links are down below. Thank you for listening. Till next time, Endeavor.